Good morning, dear saints of the Church of the Living God, you dear saints of other nations, hello, and to all others who may see. I'm reading to you this morning from the perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration, Word of God, the authorized version. If you happen to have an authorized version of the scriptures, please go ahead and grab it. And please follow me along at the scriptures that we will be looking at today and considering. Follow me along word for word, verse by verse, at what we will be looking at today. The Iberian search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Follow me along, make sure I'm telling you the truth and make sure I'm not lying to you or taking anything out of context. If you have a question about context, pause the video and search the scriptures yourself. Follow me along, as I say all the time. Follow me along because sometimes my mouth goes quicker than my brain. Sometimes I will skip a groove. So, please, I invite you to follow me along in the scriptures. We are going to begin in one of my personal favorite uh, chapters in all of Scripture, from my favoritest book of the Scriptures, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 45. Hopefully we can get this whole chapter read uh, within the time frame that is allowed. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 45. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in the book at the mouth of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch, Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow, I fainted in my sight, and I find no rest. Thus shalt thou say unto him, The Lord saith thus, Behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. Talking about him um, punishing the children of Israel, for their continued disobedience, for their continued um, um, flagrant um, disregarding the Lord God, our Father, Jesus Christ. Verse 5. And seekest thou great things for thyself? Great things. Seek them not. For behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But thy life will I give unto thee for a prey, P-R-E-Y, in all places whither thou goest. Hmm. And Paul talks about having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Great things, huh? You know... When it comes to this topic, this thought, this idea of greatness, hmm? it appears that many of these Christians, and not only relegated to these wicked Christians, but to so many others, uh, they get in front of a camera or they hide their face behind something or whatever, or whatever that they all seek to be great. They all seek to be noticed. False prophets, they run to the front. They want to be seen. They want all of this. And the Lord here warns Baruch, and seekest thou great things for thyself? Hmm. And this thing also about greatness, go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. These were not in what I sent you, uh, brethren. Um, so, so these were kind of added on. 
Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 on to verse 11. This thing about greatness. The bulb that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. Being greatly used of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, does come at a great price. Because there are very few, very few, that can, number one, remain faithful, and number two, that can handle such things. Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 on verse 11. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, John the Baptist, What went ye out into the wilderness? What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What, what, what go you out for to see when you're searching here on YouTube? You, for a spectacle, to see something, to get the visual stimuli, huh? What are you, what are you seeking? What are you, what are you looking for, huh? You know, our Lord says to judge not on the outer appearance, but to judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. Now granted, when you got some cross-dressing idiot claiming to be saved, now that's that's a totally different story, okay? But what do you what do you seek for? What are you looking for? Seek to be great at the expense of the Lord? Or do you seek to truly glorify the Lord at a cost to yourself? Verse 9, but what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy faith, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And there are those out there who think that John the Baptist was actually Elijah. He is not. Okay, in the description box there will be a video, The Spirit of Elijah, where we cover that. Okay, verse 11 Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was great, so, so right there, but check this out, notwithstanding. He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Least in the kingdom of heaven. Now you got to remember, the kingdom of heaven is always, 110% of the time, is always a reference onto the actual physical, literal kingdom in Jerusalem. Okay, you got to remember that. Okay? Our Lord says here that he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. And the Lord clearly said, we just saw it. He referred to John the Baptist as great. And that greatness came at a cost to him, didn't it? And of course, John the Baptist was faithful, of course. But what happened? He done got his head chopped off. Because he dared speak up against Herod, who had his brother's wife or something like that, right? This is also echoed in Luke chapter 7. Verses 24 on to verse 30. Luke chapter 7, verses 24 on to verse 30. You got to remember, okay? You got to remember that the kingdom of heaven is always a reference onto the physical, literal kingdom. The kingdom of God usually is a reference onto the spiritual. It can be a reference onto the kingdom of heaven, yes. But more often than not, it is a reference onto the spiritual kingdom of God. Okay? More often than not. And that is defined by but context. Okay? And you got to remember the two parts of this. Okay? The Jewish people who the Lord was sent on to at the first, sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Number one, 
They had to believe that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, the Father, the Mashiach, the Son of David, the Son of God, the Son of Man, which we covered in the previous video. Okay? But they also had to uh, trust in the fact that he is their king and he was offering them onto the, offering them the kingdom of heaven. Okay, you gotta remember that. Okay? The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, they are two different things. Like I said, the one can be a reference onto the other, but more often than not, it is a reference onto the spiritual. Okay? Alright? Let's continue. Luke chapter 7, verses 24 on to verse 30. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? The reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. And John had the baptism of repentance onto the kingdom of heaven, which was being offered onto the Jews at that time. Okay? But the Pharisees! <laughs> A Pharisee, tradition of Catholics, tradition, scripture. Tradition is here, scripture is here. That's what a Pharisee is. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Again, John the Baptist was called great by our Lord. And that greatness came at a price to his own life, obviously. And all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. <laughs> you streaming Christians. Yeah. And of course, when it comes to greatness, ultimate of greatness, of course, just very quickly, Psalm 48, and we're, we're not even into the bulk of our texts that we are going to be getting into today. Psalm 48, just two verses, one and two. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God. <laughs> Wait. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Great is our God. But see, what happens is so many people, these wicked Christians, aspire, seek to be great themselves at the expense of the Lord to make a name for themselves. But we have to remember, brethren, you read the prophets. You look into the history of the apostles, of the saints of the Church of the Living God. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs. To serve the true Lord Jesus Christ, God who is our Father, comes at a cost to us. Not salvifically but to live our life in accordance with the scripture and not compromise and be a whore taking in all comers having no distinction or separation like these whorish live streaming Christians you all a bunch of whores you take everyone both ways and why? so you can make a name for yourself by being whores
Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 46 on to verse 48. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him for his portion, and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Beg your pardon. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. And here's what we want to really consider today. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Right there in verse 48. We read that for a little context here. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. James warns people not to be not many masters. For those who ascribe to be masters going to have a, you know, have a big standard to live up to. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much, of him shall be much required. Hmm. The bulb that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, just two verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now this is, of course, from the Pauline epistles, doctrine written specifically for us today in this dispensation, which is by grace through faith. Watch out for these lying devil heretics that say it has been by grace through faith, faith alone, from Genesis on to Revelation. They are lying to you. Watch out for these devils, okay? Okay, but... 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful. Now, you look in the scriptures about stewardship a majority of the times. It's talking about... Um, Assets, uh, finance, or property, or whatever. But the stewards of the mysteries of God. Hmm. Hmm. And we are required to be faithful. Okay? Now, sometimes we do all uh, wax faint in our faithfulness, don't we? But see, when you come to the Lord on His terms, truly broken, contrite, and in fear of Him, Call upon the name of the Lord and he save you. He seals you with himself. You read about that in Ephesians chapter 1. Once saved, always saved. Watch out for these wicked devils who say that uh, there is no such thing as once saved, always saved. These guys are devil heretics. Okay? you got to watch out for them. Okay? They are justifying themselves. They are earning their own salvation. Wicked devils. Wicked devils. You gotta watch out for those guys. Okay? But go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now, can we have a 110%, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, perfect faithfulness all the time? No. Not even Paul did. Okay? But he was accounted faithful, nonetheless. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1, uh, 12 on to verse 20. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, excuse me, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. The Lord put Paul into the ministry. He didn't put himself into the ministry. He wasn't like all these false prophets and all these wicked Christians who run to the forefront, who want to be the star attraction of the theater. They want to be the superstar. You've been called to preach. 
Huh? Called to preach. Huh? Excuse me, I'm writing this down for links, <laughs> okay? For, uh, for the description box, okay? You've been called to preach. You've been called in whatever capacity to serve the Lord. It's about the Lord, not you. And when you look at these so-called Christians, well, they are Christians. They are Christians. Are they saints? No. Saints of the church of the living God. You know, and you, and then, see, some of you heretics, you know, when you, when we refer to ourselves as saints, you're like, oh, do you know? That's because you believe the lie that Rome has told you. You know, again, in the description box, what is a saint? Okay, we cover that. But, let's continue here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's read verse 12 again. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I didn't know better. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. We are at war. We are at war against the works of the devil. He who now letteth will let. We are to hinder. Okay? Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, hath have made shipwreck. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme, to deliver such a one unto to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay? And also, now let's go back to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Just two verses. One and two. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. This thing about stewards. And he said also unto his disciples. Now, we as the church of the living God, the saints of the church of the living God, we are to be faithful. We are called to be faithful. And when we come to the Lord on his terms, he saves us and seals us until the day of redemption. Okay? The Lord lives within us 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Okay? All right, and our service unto him is not at gunpoint. We have to make the right decisions. We have to make the right choices. It's none of this elect, non-elect of uh, these satanic, Calvinist idiots. Okay, it's not like that. We have to make the right decisions. But check this out in Luke chapter sixteen. Now this is before the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. Got to remember that. But here's this thing about a steward who is what? And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Now, of course, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection. And before the death, burial, burial, and resurrection, the law was still binding. It was still faith and works. Eternal security was not there. And 
Before the death, burial, and resurrection, you've got to remember that our Lord Jesus Christ was preaching on to the Hebraic people, the Jewish people, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, which is all works. Okay? In the kingdom of heaven, if you're a steward and you mess up, okay, he will remove from you being steward. Okay? Today, if you are one who will not take correction, will not adhere to the scriptures, will not live your life according to the scriptures today. Uh, the Lord can and will put you on the shelf and hand you, you know, hand you over to Satan. That uh, your flesh may be destroyed, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay? If you deny him, he will deny you. That's not talking about salvation, you hypocrites, you lying devils. No, because if you go to the Lord on his terms and he saves you, you are once saved, always saved. Okay? But you can lose a lot of other things. Your salvation you cannot lose because it's not yours to lose in the first place. Do you understand? Okay? All right? But see, when we don't do as the Lord will have us to do, we do run the risk of him denying us and many things. So if you come to the Lord truly on his terms and he saves you, you are eternally secure. Once saved, always saved. Okay? You can deny that all you want because you want to glorify yourself and make yourself look good. Okay? Hence it is your salvation. Okay? <laughs> good luck with that. All right? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 5 on to verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 on to verse 10. Okay? And here it is. See, a lot of these Christians, they're boasting themselves. They want to make themselves look good. But see, if you're called to the Lord to any capacity, it's not about you. It's not about you. And you see this self-glorification with the philosophizing of these wicked, stupid, streaming Christians. It's all about them. Especially when they're getting their little debates and bickering back and forth. It's all about them. It's, a, it's theater. Okay? But, those of us saints, those of us saints, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 on to verse 10. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. It's not about us. We are to serve others. And then you see a lot of these Christians trying to impress you with knowledge or their philosophy. It's about them. It's not about the Lord. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, a pearl of great price, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we have this treasure, our Lord Jesus Christ, sealed until the, day of, until the day of redemption. Once saved, always saved. Okay? You cannot lose what is not yours. Okay? All right? You've got to rightly divide the word of truth, friend. Okay? We have this treasure, the Lord Jesus Christ, God who is our Father. You know, the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that Spirit. Okay? He lives within us. Okay? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Amen. We are perplexed, it, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. 
My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore will I gladly glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Because when I am weak, then am I strong. Why? Because when you have no confidence in you, in your philosophy, you idiots, or your, your hyperboles or your dialectics, The only, the only strength you have is the Lord himself. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Death unto ourselves. We have no confidence in this, excuse me, in this, the sagging skin suit. We have no confidence in it. But all these wicked Christian devils, it's all about the flesh to them. They have confidence in themselves, in their wisdom, in their wits, in their hyperboles, and all that nonsense. So then death worketh in us, but life in you, a daily dying to self, to the world. We having, and what are we reading to again? We are reading on to 10, excuse me. We were to only read on the verse 10, but we, we read a little bit <laughs> more, excuse me. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. That was verse 12. And of course, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you read about if uh, verses 17 on to verse 21 if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new see the Lord in you that seal until the day of redemption God living in you permanently is what makes you a new creature because you have God within you and every single one of us who are truly saved saints are called to the ministry of reconciliation having the word of reconciliation, okay? We're all called to the ministry of reconciliation, all right? We are called to live our life in accordance with the scripture, to die to ourselves, to be not uh, conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Unto whom? When people don't want to hear the truth, what do they look at? The, the lost, these Christians, they look on only the visage and the countenance. Why? Because they have no discernment. Because the Lord isn't in them. The little G God of this world guides them, but not the Lord himself. So when we are persecuted by the lost world, by these Christians, how they behold us, how we live our lives according to the scriptures. Okay? But see, it comes at a price to us. A death. It's a death. A death to ourselves. A death to this world that the life of Jesus might be within us. Okay? He is our life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? Life is Jesus Christ. Okay? And it comes at a price. It comes at a great price. Not a price of salvation on our behalf that we're gaining or trying to earn anything like our salvation. No. And how many of you, like it says in Micah chapter 7, how many of you saints amongst your family but heads? Especially with your Christian relatives, huh? You know, go to the phallus houses and stuff like that, right? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. It comes at a great price. And we, as saints, praise the Lord for that price that we pay. And what do we pay? Our death to the world and to ourselves. 
That is the price that we pay. Because the world looks at you like you're crazy. You want, you're, you're living your life according to this? They call that crazy. They call that foolish. Okay? That is the price that we pay. You know, have you counted the cost of serving the Lord? Well, it gets easier the, the longer I go serving the Lord. Really? Really? Huh? The Lord saved me 15 years ago. It gets harder. I'm telling you. If you become familiar, oh, that's old hat, been there, done that, you have that mentality. And you walk with the Lord. What Lord are you walking with, man? You devils, you, you don't get this. But you saints, you, you do. You do. The glorious price we pay for serving our blessed Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because to serve our Lord is a price far above rubies, far above anything that Satan can offer us. Now, we're going to be in the Old Testament because we are going to look at the example of specifically two. And we're going to look at this price, this cost within the Old Testament for our instruction in righteousness. Okay? We are going to look at Elisha and Solomon. Okay? And you got to remember about Elisha and Solomon. Okay? Elisha, one of the greatest prophets ever. Okay? And King Solomon. We all know about King Solomon. These individuals lived in a time under the law where eternal security, once saved, always saved, was not there. You got these devil heretics who tell you that eternal security was under the law. They, they lie to you. Get away from these devils. Okay? They're looking to damn you that when you miss the redemption of the purchased possession, that you might take the mark of the beast and be damned to hell. Watch out for these devils, okay? Stay away from them, okay? But we are going to be looking at the, the example of these two. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, okay? We're going to be, like I said, we're going to be considering Elisha and King Solomon. 2 Kings chapter 2, we are going to be beginning at verses 9, and we are going to read on to verse 15, okay? 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 on to verse 15. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Let a double portion, a double portion of the spirit of Elisha, of Elisha, be upon Elisha. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. A double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah. Uh, note the lowercase s there. Okay? In verse 9. Okay? That's a significant thing. The capitalization of the S in spirit. Okay? Verse 10. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, here is the sign that whether or not Elisha would receive it. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Okay? Oh, by the way, um... 
Where was a where was someone saying come up hither? Hmm? That wasn't there, by the way. Just to let you know. Okay? Let's continue. Verse 12. And Elisha saw it. So what does that mean? Elisha got what he asked for. He got a double portion of the spirit that was on Elisha. Let's continue. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Excuse me. And he, and he took the... Oh, okay, excuse me. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said... Look at how he says this. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Excuse me, I'm writing this down. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. And they came to meet him, and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Now, in comparing, in comparing both Elijah and Elisha, okay, Elisha, as we read in Malachi chapter 4, Malachi chapter 4, which will be covered in that video, The Spirit of Elijah, which you, uh, which you can watch if you have any questions, okay? John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elisha. He was not Elijah, okay? But Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Okay? All right? This is talking about the second coming. Elijah is one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. The other one being Moses, not Enoch. Okay? The two witnesses are Elijah and Moses, not Elijah and Enoch. Okay? All right? Speaking of, Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 6. Okay, the two witnesses, which is also talked about in Zechariah. Okay? Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 6. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the whole earth. And of course, like I said, you can the prophecy of uh, the two witnesses also is in, can be found in the book of Zechariah. Okay. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. I remember that wicked uh, perversion of the truth that movie um, Left Behind or whatever. Um, whatever that thing was, where the two guys were breathing fire. Mm. Um, I believe it rather like Elijah, who was able to call fire down and consume the captain in the, of their 50s and stuff like that. But anyway, but it says fire proceedeth out of their mouth. 
spitting fire? Possibly. I think it more rather that they're calling, you know, calling down fire. But whatever, let's continue. Verse 6. These have power to shut up, to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Elijah. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. Moses. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Again, Moses. Okay? All right? Elisha. Elisha, the preferred prophet. Okay? And now go back to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. Elisha, the works of Elisha. The prophecies and the miracles that he did. Okay? Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, if I can get there, okay? 1 Kings chapter 18, we know that Elijah killed 850 false prophets. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19. Ver, uh, ver, one verse. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. 850 prophets. Also in verse 40, we see, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the book, brook Kishon and slew them there. Okay? The miracles of Elijah and Elisha. When you look at them in scripture, okay, Elisha did indeed get a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah, okay? And we and when you uh, look this up for yourself, um, the number of them, uh, let me see, I have this written down here somewhere, I beg your pardon, I'm looking at my notes, okay? The miracles of Elijah, as recorded in Scripture, number anywhere between 13 and 14 miracles and prophecies. The miracles that Elisha did, the miracles, the prophecies, and whatnot, numbered anywhere between 27 and 28. Numerically, Elijah, Elisha did more than Elijah did. You can look this up on your own, okay? The uh, miracles that Elisha did, the prophecies and that kind of stuff, were more in number than Elijah did, okay? They were. He, because he got a double portion, all right? But, uh, and also, too, both Elijah and Elisha both did uh, similar miracles. They both raised people from the dead. First Kings... 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 22, just one verse about Elijah. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Okay? Elijah brought the one child back to life. Okay? Elisha, in 2 Kings chapter 4, in 2 Kings chapter 4, we see a similar thing. Uh, verses 32 on to verse 37, okay? And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shulamite. So he called her and when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. So both Elijah and Elisha brought people back to life. But numerically, numerically, Elijah did more than Elijah. But there again, Elijah 
as we saw in Malachi, okay, he is the preferred prophet over Elisha. But Elisha was mightily used of the Lord. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Now, considering what we saw in 2 Kings chapter 2, look at that verse 9 again. Okay, in 2 Kings chapter 2. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Okay? Now let's look at Solomon. Okay? Solomon. Go to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Let's look at Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 on to verse 15. In Gabaon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Hmm. And that's something, huh? And that's something. What would you do if the Lord asked, came to you? It's like, Ask me what I shall give you. Elisha asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. And he got it. And did more miracles than Elijah. He did. But yet, Elijah is the preferred prophet over Elisha. Even though Elisha was a great man of God. Yes, he was. And did many miracles. Yes, he did. Let's continue. What would you do in that situation? And Solomon said, Thou hast shewed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth, and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child, I know not how to go out or come in. One of the wisest men that ever lived. And Solomon is right there saying, like, I don't know how to be a king. And thy servant is in the midst of, the, of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Look what he asks for. Now this is also, uh, the account also is given in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1 on to verse 12, where it is said in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, where Solomon asks for wisdom, okay? Okay? Wisdom, the fear of the Lord, and understanding, departing from evil, okay? Not a contradiction, but check this out. Verse 9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. Why? To judge thy people. That I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this? Thy so great a people. Think about that. Like I said, on your own time I have it here. We're not going to look at it. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1 on to verse 12. Okay, echoes virtually the same thing. Solomon, one of the greatest uh, kings of, in the history of Israel, one of the greatest, but also one of the worst. Not the worst, but because of what happened, because of his greatness. More on that in a bit, okay? But look what he asked for. He asked for understanding. It also says in Second Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1 on to verse 12, that he asked for wisdom. But what for? To what end? That he may serve and benefit the people. Not himself. How many of these wicked Christians out here go to Satan? Give me something that I may be something. Like Shimon the sorcerer. 
Give me this power that so who that whosoever I lay my hands on, they may receive the Holy Ghost as well. Why was he asking that? For the betterment of others? No. So that he could make himself look good. So that he could be a great one, huh? Verse 10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And the Lord knew what he was going to ask. Of course he did. But it was pleasing unto him. Because Solomon at this time, he asked not for himself, but that he may serve others by that gift that the Lord gives him. Are you selfishly asking for something of the Lord that you may be the one to be admired? Hmm? So that you look good, uh, that you get all the subscribers and the views. Huh? Is it about you? Hmm? Hmm. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. So that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And look at this. Okay. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. So the Lord's like, okay, he was pleased asked for the right thing out of the right reason out of the right heart and because you have done that seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added on to you okay he Solomon started out right and the Lord's like because you have done this I'll give you all these other things that you haven't but see now here's where it gets a little interesting okay because we all know that fame Riches, wealth, popularity, gain is godliness, right? That can corrupt. Look at what Solomon was admonished of the Lord to do after the Lord said, Okay, you did this thing. I was pleased that you asked that, but I'm also going to give you this. Check this out. Verse 14. And this is where you take your pen. Circle that little that two letter word if and if thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. Remember, this is during the dispensation where eternal security, unlike today, was there. That was not there. Eternal security, the seal until the day of redemption, was not there under the law. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God could come and go, come and go. Eternal security was not there. Okay, we've talked about that in depth. So, the Lord's like, if thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants, serving others. And you know a very interesting contrast about Elisha and King Solomon? Where in Elisha do you see anything about serving others? Even though he did. Even though the Lord used him mightily for his glory. Yes, he did. 
But what I'm going to submit to you, and we're going to see this in the scripture, I'm going to submit unto you that Elijah, Elisha, okay, Elisha was a little bit on the self-serving side, even though he was mightily used of the Lord and one of the great prophets, but yet he didn't attain unto Elisha's standing. Okay? And this thing here about how the Lord gave him riches. You go to Deuteronomy chapter 17, okay? This is something that uh, people have uh, uh, brought up as a, it's a contradiction. The Lord gave Solomon riches, but yet those riches corrupted him. It's like, well, that's a kind con- no, 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 okay? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 on to verse 20, Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14, unto the close of the chapter. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. And this happens in 1 Samuel. Okay? Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Someone who is in a Hebrew. Someone who is in a Jew. Okay? But now, look at this verse. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he shall should multiply horses. Solomon messed that up. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Oh, Solomon blew that one. The daughter of Pharaoh was his preferred wife. It was, it was surmised that uh, the Song of Solomon was written about Pharaoh's daughter. Okay? There's actually no real scriptural proof to prove that, but it is surmised that uh, the Song of Songs was, writ- was obviously written about Solomon's favored ro- wife, who was a Gentile, which is why it is believed that it is about Pharaoh's daughter. Okay? But Solomon blew that. We're going to look at that. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. To himself. Neither shall he greatly, greatly, look at this, don't look at me, look at the scripture. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And people will point out, well, well, the Lord gave him. It's like uh, what he says here in verse 13 in second in 1 Kings 3. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. Okay? Now, obviously, as king, uh, an increase is going to come. But see, the warning in... Deuteronomy 17, 17. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself riches and gold. Solomon did that. Okay? Solomon did that. Okay? Multiply to himself. Okay? Verse 18. See, there was what the Lord gave. And of course, there would be increase, of course, because of commerce and trade and stuff like that. But Solomon greatly increased it himself. The Lord gave him what he didn't ask for. But you see the life of Solomon, that he went above and beyond, didn't he? Let's continue in Deuteronomy 17. Let's close out this chapter. And it shall be when he sitteth again, remember... Remember verse 14 in uh, 1 Kings chapter 3? And if thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments as 
thy father David did walk, then will I lengthen thy days. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests of the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. And that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. Because broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Right? Okay? That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. And that he turn not aside from the commandment, to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Hmm. Very interesting, isn't that? Okay. And go now to 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 14 on to verse 21. Note this number which is a number of man. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 14 on to verse 21. Okay? The Lord gave Solomon what he didn't ask for, but Solomon greatly increased it himself. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. Hmm. Even devils can get the tie in there in Revelation. 666. The number of a man. Hmm? Let's continue. See, what the Lord gave Solomon, that blessing, I'll give you what you didn't ask for. Okay? There would have been a, a gradual increase over time, yes. But as you read about Solomon, that he, he took it, he took that base of what the Lord gave him comfortably and zoop! <laughs> We're going to look at that here a little bit more in depth, but let's continue. Beside that he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. And, the, and King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. I remember um, seeing or reading about gold is a soft metal and uh, the Egyptians were ones that also used gold as armor and uh, you can, uh, gold is not that strong of a metal, it's a softer metal and as an armor it would have been kind of futile because if you were to bash a golden shield it, it would it would be damaged it would be weaker gold is a weaker metal than iron or or anything like that okay but let's continue okay and he made 300 shields of beaten gold three pound of gold went to one shield and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon moreover the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side on the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the stays. And twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other, upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. Verse 21. And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. Check this out. None were of silver. Silver. A precious metal. Worth a lot. Especially in today's standard, right? Silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. So gold and riches. And what was that? Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. Like, I forget what the weight differential is, but like thousands of pounds of gold, okay, or tons even, in one year, where silver, a precious metal, was like 
nothing? We saw God gave Solomon that which he didn't ask for, riches and honor. But Solomon took that and went beyond that. Okay? Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Where are we? Chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Let's see what Solomon himself had to say of it. Did he... Um, was Solomon a little high on himself? Towards the end of his life, I don't think so. You know, you read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, you know, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. And also he taught the people uh, knowledge and set in order many proverbs. So he taught the people, okay? Yes, he was. But Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 on to verse 11. Check this out. I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. King Solomon had everything at his disposal. You know, you, you think about these Hollywood movie stars and these, these wealthy rich men today. Sol Solomon had a thousand women at his disposal who weren't whores or harlots, who would do whatever he said at the drop of a hat, okay? Okay? I said of laughter, it is mad. And of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, acquainting my heart unto wisdom, fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge. Okay? And to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. He wanted his cake and eat it too. Here's the king who had everything at his disposal. So I'm going to drink a little. Let me see what this is all about. I have all this stuff. Talk about a price to pay for fame. And can, uh, would you even dare to argue that King Solomon was one of the more famous people that ever lived? Hmm? Verse 4. Now, look, like I said to a brother of mine who had a, a part in uh, doing this, um, at your own leisure, you know, take your little pen from verse 4 on to verse 11 here. Circle the personal pronoun I here. Check this out. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and made servants. I got me servants, excuse me, and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great. Look at them eyes there. I, 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 I. Well, he is just stating fact, yes. But you, do you think any of this went to Solomon's head? Come on. Come on. Fame, greatness comes at a price. Why do you think Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him? If anyone could have had, and, and Paul did have a pride problem. You see that demonstrated in Acts, what is it? Uh, Acts chapter 26 or 21, I believe it is. Okay? Paul had a pride problem. And if anyone could have had, you know, the chutzvah, 
Paul, who wrote a majority of the New Testament. But there was a thorn given to him in the flesh to, to knock them feet out from under him. I myself, I have a pride problem myself. I daily struggle with pride. The Lord has given me a thorn in the flesh. I have brethren who keep me, you know, you know, praise the Lord. Sisters even. Verse 9, so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. But yet he acquainted himself unto wine and the folly. And verse 10, look at this. He had the best of the world. There wasn't anything that Solomon could not do. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. Think about that. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. And I love verse 11. Because when you die, you can't take this with you. All these famous people, they're in the grave. They're in hell. You know, Paul talks about not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise are called. Why? Because of this very thing that we are addressing. Very, very few people can handle the cost that it comes with of being a great one. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. When you die, your greatness will not descend after you. Naked came you into this world, and naked you shall return thither. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You, you want to be, you know, run. Look at me like the false prophets Jeremiah talks about in uh, Jeremiah 23. They run. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Hot shots. But what, with all this, and now, you know, and towards the end, this is when Solomon was older. This was his autobiography, if you will. Okay, I personally believe that King Solomon uh, made it to heaven. I do. I do. There are those that dispute that. Uh, we'll find out when we get there, brethren. Okay? But what was, pro what, see, with this thing, how Solomon went above and beyond what the Lord gave him. What happened? We all know, but let's read it. 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. <laughs> Greatness comes at a cost, dear people. Seek how great things. 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1, on to verse 13. Oh, this is too much scripture for you, huh? Go away. This is for those who are serious. <laughs> but King Solomon loved many strange women. Strange women. He went outside his kindred, outside of the Jewish Hebraic people. Okay, And the reason why the Lord told Israel not to do that was because, is it not evident that our Lord sprang of Judah? Okay, God manifest in the flesh would come of Israel. Okay, But anyway, but King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Lot's descendants. 
Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. Why? Why? For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. His heart at the first that we saw. A heart of charity, which is self-sacrifice. Okay? He asked for something that it may be a benefit unto others, not unto himself. But in the latter end, because of what he achieved, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after the after Ashtoreth, Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. We saw how Solomon began. But after he got these, he multiplied all this stuff in contrary to Scripture. Okay? Not that the Lord gave it to him to tempt him, but Solomon went above and beyond himself and did it. Okay? Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon, and likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And we saw the Lord's like, do what I say. In a dispensation where eternal security was not there. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Solomon was great. He achieved two astronomical heights. One of the wisest men that ever lived. And you think you can brazenly handle the responsibility of some things that you ask for. Those of you, it's like, oh, I wish I had a million dollars. Could you handle that kind of responsibility? <laughs> See, I couldn't. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I couldn't handle that responsibility. For the love of money is the root of all evil, for which while some coveted after they have veered from the pay, uh, faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And he had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Verse 11. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee. I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe for thy son, for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Then you read about how the Lord stirred up adversary Solomon, who was to be a king of peace. But because his riches and all these, he loved many strange women. He could, ultimately, if he had just kept with what the Lord had given and not sought after more. Some would argue, well, that was just a natural consequence. 
Mm. Obviously, King Solomon got a little bit enamored with his own self. And even in the book of Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 13, we, we see that Nehemiah even makes mention of uh, verses 23 under verse 27. After, the, after they were brought back, after the captivity of 70 years in Jerusalem, in Babylon, Nehemiah 13, verses 23 on to verse 27. In those days also I saw Jews that had married wives of Astad, of Ammon, and of Moab. And their children spake half in the speech of Astad, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or yourselves. <laughs> Why? See, when you go outside of what the Lord has commanded, problems arise. What, what fellowship hath light with darkness? Okay, what concord hath Christ with Belial? What good would it do for a saint to marry an atheist? Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these? Yet among many nations was there no king like, unto, like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. <laughs> Think you can handle these things? Huh? You seek for greatness, to be a great one, to be well known, to be Mr. Popular. Look at me. Ultimate suffering reveals absolutely, uh, and absolute suffering absolutely reveals. <laughs> Put that however you want it. A absolute power um, uh, absolutely corrupts. <laughs> it really does. It's absolutely revealing. Okay? Very few. Very few. Solomon couldn't handle it, after all. Okay, and of course, in Second Kings chapter seventeen, this pattern of uh, this pattern in Second Kings chapter seventeen, and this we see likened onto today in Second Kings chapter seventeen, verses thirty-two on to verse seven uh, forty-one. Second Kings seventeen, verses thirty-two on to verse forty-one. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. They didn't really fear the Lord, but since they feared the Lord, with their mouth they shew much love. But their heart goeth after covetousness. And the Lord abhorreth the covetous. You read about that in Psalm 10. Okay? So, so many people say that they love the Lord and that they serve him, but their hearts go after their covetousness. They, they, want, the, they want their cake and eat it too. They want to have the fellowship. They want to eat at the table of the Lord and the table of devils. They want the best of both worlds. And then you got these easy believism devil heretics who come along and say, you can. Because you just believe, right? Huh. This is happening today. Verse 34. Unto this day they do after the former manners. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. People say, well, that's a contradiction. No, 
in appearance, in word. They claimed to fear the Lord, but in heart, they were their own gods. They sought glory to make themselves a name. Let us make ourselves a name. You know, let us build ourselves a tower and make ourselves a name that it may reach unto heaven. We, ye shall be as gods. Okay? See what's going on? With whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord who brought you up out of the, out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear. And him shall ye worship, and to him shall ye do service. And the statutes, and the ordinances, and the law, and the commandment which he wrote for you, ye shall observe to do forevermore, and ye shall not fear other gods. And the covenant that I have made with you, ye shall not forget, neither shall ye fear other gods. But the Lord your God ye shall fear, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. How be it? They did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord. They said they did. There's no contradiction here. They proclaimed, professed to fear the Lord. You are because you say you are, right? But in reality, they weren't. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. Now, how does this reckon with Elijah? Or, excuse me, with Elisha? King Solomon, one of the greatest kings ever, himself couldn't handle the cost of that greatness, which he went above and beyond, be above and beyond, excuse me. Okay? But what about Elisha? Go to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings. Chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. Excuse me, one second. Excuse me, first Kings 19. I couldn't read my own writing. First Kings 19. Okay? Let's go to First Kings 19, verses 15 on to verse 21. Okay, now this First Kings 19 obviously is after the whole thing that Elijah did with the false prophets. He ran at the threat of Jezebel. Okay, all right. First Kings 19 verses 15 on to verse 21. And the Lord said unto him, unto Elijah, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mohola shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet... I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha. Now pay attention to this. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elisha and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Very similar to how Boaz put his skirt over Ruth, okay? Covered him. It's like here, took his mantle here. You're going to be prophet in my room, okay? And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Look at this. And said, let me, pr I pray thee, Kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? 
And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave on to the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Hmm. So Elisha, after Elijah cast his mantle on him, what does he say? The first thing? Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and mother, and then will I follow thee. And then Elijah's like, go, go, what, what have I done to you? Check this out, check this out. Go to... <laughs> oh, wow. Go to Luke chapter 9. Verses 52 on to verse 50, uh, 52 on to verse 62. Luke chapter 9. Am I in the right place? Oh, excuse me, I wrote down the wrong. Excuse me. Luke chapter 9 verses 57 on to verse 62. Okay? 57 on to verse 62. And it came to pass, as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, had nowhere to rest his head. Of course, and of course, when reading this, you, know, you go hold your place there and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9 on to verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 9 on to verse 14. Okay. <clears throat> For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. But ye are wise in Christ. Big shots. Yeah. We are weak, but ye are strong. This is sarcasm, by the way. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. As for us this, uh, this month, due to things beyond our control, we are behind. We have no certain dwelling place. But yet, how many out there seek great things? And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. We bless our enemies by telling them the truth. That's how you love your enemies today. Okay? Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscurring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Okay? Go back to Luke chapter 9. Our Lord says, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Seekest thou great things, huh? And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Check this out. And another also said unto, and another also said, Lord, I will follow, follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. Look at what the Lord says. And Jesus said unto him, no man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Hmm. Hmm. Brad, are you, are you saying 
Elisha wasn't fit for the kingdom of God? God used Elisha mightily. He did numerically more miracles and prophecies than even Elisha. Yes, he did. But what cannot be denied with what we just read there, Elisha, what was his first thing? What did he first say after Elijah put his mantle on him? Let me go back and kiss my father and mother. And Elisha asked for what? A double portion. You know what I think was Elisha's weakness? That he was a little bit self-serving. That he wanted to be, that he, I think he enjoyed. I really do. I truly, truly do. I think that Elisha enjoyed being the prophet of the hour. I really do. I really do. And when you look at this, in contrast to Elijah, go to 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Uh, go to 1 Kings chapter 19, okay? 1 Kings, back to 1 Kings chapter 19, okay? Let's read now verses 9 on to verse 14. You see how we did that? And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? When Elijah fled from Jezebel, okay? Look at what Elijah says. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. Behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Look at verse 4 here in 1 Kings 19. Elijah, after he was threatened by Jezebel, he ran at the behest of a woman. He killed all these prophets, okay? Did all these mighty things, but he ran because of a woman threatening him. But check this out. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O oh Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Elijah, look at that. Look at that humility. Look at that meekness. Look at that meekness. Elijah was a humble, meek man. He had, you know, you, you read in James, he had, you know, he had such passions and temptations as you and I. Okay? Yes, he did. But Elijah was a very meek and humble man. I'm not better than my father's. Okay? Elisha 
Show me in Scripture. Show me in Scripture that of Elisha. Elisha, a mighty prophet of God, used mightily. Yes, he did. Yes, he was. Did more, again, numerically than Elijah. But Elijah was preferred for Elisha. Elisha asked for a double portion. And you, you, you look at, into the, the number of the things that Elisha did was more, greater than Elijah. Yes, they were. But yet, in the grand scheme of things, Elisha is preferred above Elisha. And one verse here in 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Just one verse. 2 Kings chapter 2. Verse 24. Hmm. One of the, one of the very, you know, besides the dividing of the things, you know, uh, making the water sweet. Look at what Elisha did to someone who mocked him. Okay? I'm not saying that Elisha was a, I, no, no. What I am saying, what I am suggesting was Elisha, who asked for a double portion and got it, paid a heavy price for that. And that he was a little bit more self-seeking and self-serving. And that Elisha liked being in the spotlight. That's what I'm suggesting to you. That's what I'm suggesting to you. Okay? Verse 24 in 2 Kings chapter 2. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them, these kids, who, went, who said to him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up to him. Go up, thou bald head. They came and mocked her. Apparently, Elisha had a bald head. <laughs> okay? And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. So these... Uh, Forty of uh, these children came and mocked him. And he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And bears came and tore them up. The Lord used Elisha mightily. Elisha the prophet is in heaven. Absolutely. But I'm suggesting to you that Elisha enjoyed the lion might. That he enjoyed being on top. Okay? He was a servant of the Lord. He stood before the Lord. The Lord used him mightily. He had mighty prophecies. He did mighty works. He, uh, again, numerically did more than Elijah. He, he brought people back to life. And his death Okay, a, a dead body touched the bones of Elisha, and that guy came back to life. Yes, but Elisha, I believe, he enjoyed it. Well, aren't we supposed to enjoy the servant of, service of the Lord? But see, it's not about us. The Lord, it's not about us. It's about the Lord. I, uh, I believe that Elisha, Elisha was self-serving. I believe Elisha enjoyed the limelight. I really do. Let me look. You know, the first thing he said, let me go back and say goodbye. And Elijah is like, what have I done to you? Go. I'm not saying at all that Elisha wasn't, isn't in heaven. Not at all. Not at all. But see, that greatness that Elisha had came at a very, very heavy price. Go to 2 Kings chapter 13 now. 2 Kings chapter 13. Verses 14 on to verse 25. Okay? Now, Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. Hold up right there. Okay? 
He brought back someone to life. Okay? Elisha did mighty miracles more than Elijah. But yet, he got sick. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. The bulb that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. Elisha asked for a double portion. The Lord gave it to him. Like I said, numerically, in comparison, Elisha with the prophecies and miracles, anywhere between 13 and 14. Elisha, okay, more than doubled between 27 and 28. Now Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Very similar to what he said, what Elisha said unto Elijah. Okay? But Elisha died of sickness. Interesting. Not of old age, not as a martyr, but was sick. That's very interesting. And Elisha said unto him, in his sickness, had a double portion, take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria, and the arrow of deliverance from, of, from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou, till thou have consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him. And said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria, till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast a man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood upon his feet. Even the bones of Elisha brought someone back to life. He had a double portion. Because Elisha, I believe, enjoyed being number one. He enjoyed the spotlight. Elisha's in heaven, one of the greatest prophets ever, mighty in power, had a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah. But it is Elijah that was preferred above Elisha. Our Lord even mentions Elisha. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But the one fallback, the one tink, the one thing where Elijah was subject to like passions as you and I, Elisha, I think he loved the limelight. I think he loved the limelight. I think he enjoyed being the number one prophet. I really do. I really do. I really do. And seekest thou great things for yourself? Hmm? Who could handle this responsibility? Elisha died of sickness, not of old age or martyrdom. Hmm. But sickness. And you know, I said to verse uh, 25. But let's read. But Hazel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoaz. 
And the Lord was gracious unto them, and had compassion on them, and had respect unto them, because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them. Neither cast he them from his presence as yet. So Hazel king of Syria died, and Ben-Hadad his son reigned in his stead. And Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad the son of Hazel the cities, which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz his father by war. Three times did Joash beat him and recovered the cities of Israel. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're almost done. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. With great power, with great whatever, comes great responsibility. Okay. Oh, one second. Sorry about that. James chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. James warns. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. I'm going to give an account of everything that I have said to you, and I have taught to you. Brethren, saints, church of the living God, and all you my enemies, I'm going to give an account to the Lord for what I've said. Okay? I am. I am. Being in this position is a great sacred responsibility. And yet, see, these devils make light of it. And they run to the forefront and they want to be the star of the show. They want to dance and fret their stuff upon the stage. Full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Got to be careful price to be paid. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 14 on to verse 15. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. Okay? But you. I'm not doing this because I want to be popular the Lord provides for us through this, yes. That's not why this is, this is not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because the, this is what the Lord has called me to. To preach unto lost people, to edify and strengthen the brethren, to warn people of what's coming. Not about being in the limelight, being a superstar, being a showman, nothing like that. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Verse 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. It's not about me. It's not about, it's not about the messenger. It's about the message and the one who has given us the word of reconciliation and the ministry of Seek out great things for yourself. Again, in the description box called to preach where we, where we talk about these things, you know. To speak the same things unto you, to me, is not grievous, but for you it is safe to remind you. You got all these people wanting to be, look at me, look at me, I'm a somebody. I'm a saint of the church of the living God. I don't want to do. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be well known. Thou, O oh Lord, Jesus Christ, God my Father. Heart of a servant. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. For though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. Not love. Charity. There's a big difference. Charity is self-sacrifice. You can love. Look at these sodomites. They love one another, right? They love sin. Charity is self-sacrifice. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, 
I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to, eat, body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up when you're living and serving others. Sacrificing of self. Not to be, hey, look at what I've done. No. That you're, you have the heart of a servant. Like Solomon did at the beginning. And Elisha, mightily used of the Lord, asked for a double portion. But the first thing he said when, his man, when Elijah put his mantle on him, let me go back. God used him mightily. But then again, like I said, I believe Elisha, he liked being on top, I think. I think he liked being number one. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth self-sacrifice for the right reasons. Not to benefit yourself, but for him who has called you. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For now we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, then that which is in part shall be done away. And some of you wicked streamers need to remember this. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Hence charity. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even all as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity, self-sacrifice. You have to watch out, brethren, people, for these Christians who are in doing things just to make themselves look good and have no care about the people who they are trying who they want to reach so that they can become something great. You got that's that's not a servant of the Lord. And see with much power, with much what was that? What was that in uh, Luke chapter twelve? Luke chapter twelve, right? Luke chapter 12, verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him shall they ask the more. All that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost? Do you think you can handle these things? And see, here's the thing. You need to know in and of yourself that you can't. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities. 
power of Christ may be strong in me. What is that again? That's in what? Second Corinthians? Second Corinthians chapter what? Eleven, I believe that is. Or twelve. Excuse me. Second Corinthians chapter twelve. <laughs> Verse 7, under verse 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather... Glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, for, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Why? Because Christ's grace, the grace of Christ, is sufficient for us. And as long as you got these Christians, who boast themselves of their uh, their rhetoric, of their philosophy, and you know, how I try to impress people with big words and stuff like that. They have confidence in the flesh. And we saints of the Church of the Living God, we have no confidence in the flesh. That is going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. Please, brethren, keep us in your prayers. Uh, we need all the prayers we can get. Pray for one another. Be there for one another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Thank you for watching this if you do. We love you. We will see you in the next video. Whenever that shall be. Thank you.